Oh, kind of not a lovely day in the neighborhood. Probably should be wearing a hat, it's raining and such. Anyway, um, it's yeah, been a rough couple of days for me. Anyway, oh, anyway, quite miserable. <laughs> anyway, Professor Anton video, yay. So anyway, him and this uh, handsome guy, who's, you know, really a phantasmic oracle. I mean, you could call them both hippies, you know, they're kind of, uh, you know, around my generation, you know, a little lesser. But, um, yeah, just forget about it. Anyway, um, it's this ontology, this epistemology crap where, you know, we know there's a reality, and then there's our ability to perceive reality. And this sort of relates to a lot of conversations on YouTube, apparently. And I don't think there's any need to sit there and slice and dice it to pieces. Uh, we're changed by every second of interaction we have with the universe. It's constantly impacting our, our insular planetoid that is ourselves and uh, reforming it, changing its mass, its density, its uh, energy level, it's all this bullshit. So there's no point in um, denying the fact that we, when we perceive reality, we are perceiving just a, a segment uh, of the context. But it's usually an important segment of the context. Um, we're we're, <laughs> we're kind of designed to, uh, you know, pick out the important bits. And, um, yeah, that's sort of the way it works. I mean, if we found out there were, you know, the whole universe was, you know, somehow they were doing the Star Wars thing and there's all kinds of civilizations out there and they're doing all kinds of interesting, fun things and blah, blah, blah. Um, we would be like, wow, we were so ignorant. <laughs> you know, here we are at the far end of a galaxy they hadn't explored yet uh, because there's so much to get to and they just haven't gotten to us yet. And uh, and we'd say, boy, we looked up in the sky and we didn't know that was going on. And so we could conclude that our, our uh, epistemology didn't match the ontology or vice versa, whatever. You know, that uh, we, our perception of reality uh, didn't really do justice to reality. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a problem we might have, but I don't think that has anything to do with our the problem of our reality. <laughs> our reality is more about um, contextualizing and understanding our own existence and the mechanics of it. And um, you could think about, like, physics, for example. Um, you know, the understanding has evolved with time. I have to be a little careful I don't slip here. It's a little slimy. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a much richer, uh, you know, in terms of the amount of information we have. As time passes, we get more information. We get more and more sophisticated and sometimes even simpler models, but more accurate models, one can safely assume and uh, getting closer to the picture anyway. And that's sort of what we're doing. We're, we're taking the scatter that is reality and putting the puzzle pieces in more explicit order uh, through the process of our intelligence and uh, the acquisition of our knowledge stored in our brain and in the um, peripheral indexes, books, <laughs> and diagrams, and drawings, and notes that we take throughout our life to uh, help us uh, retain information. Um, because, yeah, we're not perfect at that. We forget things. We lose stuff. And that's the part of this functionality also. Uh, you know, it's a liability of it. Um, <clears throat> but we can compensate for that, like I said, by writing stuff down and storing records of it and recording videos or whatever we do to uh, retain uh, 
perspectives um, and uh, <clears throat> emphasis. Emphasis is a good word. Um, so, uh, so I just don't see any problem here. I mean, Professor Anton talks as if this is some sort of problem, that thinking about reality and living in reality are somehow not perfectly compatible, and they are. Um, and, uh, but I think it's more just because they don't think reality has revealed itself to us. That somehow the, <laughs> you know, Mother Nature hasn't disrobed entirely. And so we haven't seen all the, uh, what they think are probably some sort of marvelous bits or something. And <laughs> I'm like, oh no, we've, we've got the skanky whore nailed. And, uh... She ain't got no secrets. Uh, not, not too many left. Uh, and uh, this game is quite dissectable, quite understandable uh, from the amount of knowledge we have gleaned from the world and the environment. We can draw so many conclusions. Uh, we can put so much of this together in a rational, connected dot kind of way. And that's uh, probably another, like I said, that's a good metaphor for the fact that, um, you know, any connect-the-dot drawing, you can make mistakes. You can connect the dots wrong, and then the image will look, it will be wrong. It might look close, but it'll still be wrong. Uh, but the general idea might still be there. It might be hard to turn a connect-the-dot drawing of you know, a flower into a nuclear bomb. It might be possible, but... So anyway, I'm, uh, <clears throat> we have pretty well labeled dots. Uh, let's, let me say. So most of them are labeled pretty well. The pattern is, is you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's there. I say, you know, this is Darwin all over the place in the sense of its evolution all over the place. Uh, you know, I guess Darwin really shouldn't be the key word for that word, but um, but that's the concept. Uh, it's a, a reproducing molecule, and over time, it changes and adapts based on pressures created by the environment. Pressures. <sighs> I find that an interesting word now, just because I was doing some physics stuff and playing with pressure as a concept in the world. And uh, you know, I think it, I think it means something. <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a big part of everything: gravity, electricity, photons. I think they're all under pressure. <laughs> yeah, I have to describe that in some way, but. Anyway, that's a whole different subject, <clears throat> but it's not different, right? It's part of this context of this physical universe doing crude mechanical things, and that in this one portion, there's a swirl in the water, and it looks like Richard Nixon. Why? Who knows why? Yeah, it came out really, really strange this time. It is bizarre. Yes, we can call it that. Uh, but really, I mean, if you were digging potatoes and you found a potato that looked just like you, uh, you know, you'd, you'd say, wow, that's really, really bizarre. Uh, it's incredible. But you wouldn't say, there, it's proof of God. You'd understand that this is what is possible in the world. And it's possible for, uh, obviously, for biomass to do more than, uh, you know, green algae. That uh, if, it, if a certain chain of events takes place in a certain environment, uh, it can do something just frickin' bizarre. And I claim that's what we are. Uh, and you can see the flaws that demonstrate uh, that it isn't some sort of um, a design that would be on purpose. Uh, we're flawed enough 
<laughs> we're, we're flawed more than enough, but you know, most people have too much ego to admit that. But there, there's too much flaw in how we play the game and the tool that we play the game with, this body, uh, its imperfections and flaws. Um, but they, they're so human uh, c celebrity struck that they can't admit the truth regarding what we are. Uh, because their own subjective conditioned uh, attachment is so overwhelming that they have no hope of grasping the truth of it or any kind of uh, you know, real connect the dot context. Um, so anyway, back to these words again. Yeah, I just think it's so corrosive to conversation to use words that are uh, not, I mean, they're just horribly defined. I mean, you know, the, the, the subtle distinctions between these words, ontology, uh, um, epistemology, uh, schemistiology, <laughs> you know, you could just keep making up more and more of them. And they're all a different way of saying what is the truth. Uh, you know, and then the opposite version, uh, you know, there's people who are saying the truth is too complicated, and then there's other people who are just simplifying it so, uh, um, so much, uh, you know, that they break the very idea of the fact that we have the capacity to see a context, to understand uh, what are the important bits, and to do it with something other than our stomach and our reproductive organs. <laughs> you know, that that's what our brain is sort of, you know, capable of, is making us smarter than reflexes. Even though our brain is reflexes, the reflexes are uh, patterned, uh, formatted to a construct of logic. Uh, they can do it, and uh, there's every reason to do it. Um, and clearly we can do it to a very high end of complexity and abstraction. I mean, you know, what physics, what physicists and mathematicians do, uh, you know, some of it is very difficult. Uh, it takes quite a lot of work. Uh, the language is so obtuse um, to be able to, uh, you know, do it intuitively, to make it your own, to make it yourself, to understand it so well, uh, to, to gain a comfort with it. Um, and, uh, you know, it requires a, a high degree of, of complexity, a grasping of a complexity, uh, like playing chess. And, you know, a great chess player is, you know, has to have a, an awful lot of um, storage um, uh, of, of, of relationships, understanding them, understanding the, the depth they go to and the uh, subtle patterns they create. And uh, yeah, so somewhere in between those two things, obviously I don't think you, you know, if you get too deep, I mean, if you get too uh, caught up in the singular detail, then you won't be able to see the big picture, you know, if you're too close to the forest. And if you're too far away, it's no good either. So there has to be something, you know, you can't make the drawing too few pixels or you can't try to look at too many pixels. It's like when you deliberately try to walk or deliberately try to breathe, you'll you screw it up. Uh, but, um, yeah, you know, so I'm just, I, I'm not, I'm just saying that there, there's the, the danger of finding God in either one of these extremes, and I think that's what people have done. If they reduce it enough, they don't have to justify anything, and if they complexify it enough, they can keep uh, finding some place uh, unresolved enough to say God lives there. You know, people do that with quantum, an awful lot, quantum mechanics, and uh, it's just pretty bogus. It's not only a distortion of what we do know, uh, but it's a, a projection 
uh, you know, uh, even on the lie. Even if you lie about quantum mechanics, it still can't come up with this crap. Um, it still doesn't resolve the irresolvable issue that there is absolutely nothing sensible about the idea of complexity being eternal <laughs> and having it create crude. That is imbecilic. Um, it's uh, non sequitur. It's oxymoronic. It's a non-starter conceptually altogether. And such. So anyway, I just don't see the point of arguing about um, whether we can grasp all of reality in our mind, because I don't think we can. But we can understand what a Hitler is. We can understand him in different subtle, different ways. You know, we can put him in all kinds of different categories. Confused, silly, immature. You know, you can use lots of softer words, or you can use uh, maniacal, evil, you know, a lot of other kind of words. But the point is, is you can understand it, put it in these general categories, and those categories would be generally accurate relative to other things you put in the same category that has similar properties. So again, we're back to categories and properties. I think it's a very, I think those two words are the substance of rational perspective. Uh, that's the way to see what we're doing. Uh, the entirety of, of sensible thought is dependent on recognizing that that's the function. And, uh, yeah. and so I think that would be enough. I'm going to finish doing the lights here. Uh, do a video of it sometime when they're done. It is, you know, a quite adequate display and such. So, until next time. Yeah, I might as well do a little bit of an add-on since I'm here. I've got to walk. Homework. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I could run, but I'd probably fall down into it. It's kind of muddy. Anyway. Uh, so continuing with the story of how earthlings, you know, we're all called earthlings, and yet here we are living on very different planets. You know, it's kind of funny when you think that, you know, we we'll all start here. You know, all all have pretty much access to the, uh, all, I guess all the people listening to this video anyway, certainly have access to, you know, huge databases of information, volumes and volumes of records of what it is to be uh, alive and human. Um, I guess uh, some people might not be uh, English literate for reading, so maybe they don't have quite as much, but it's still a lot of stuff. <laughs> I'm sure all kinds of books are written in all kinds of languages. Some of them in the original, which maybe is even better than the English version. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, and it just seems here we are, same planet, lots of the same resources, and, uh, you know, we're, we're just different kinds of people. There's uh, technical people and science people and, and there's space cadets and loop-de-loos and witch doctors and liars and frauds and fakes and phonies. And it's, uh, it is one of the peculiarities of our species that, uh, this is part of our adaptability. Part of what gave humans the advantage was their capacity to diversify, to exploit any environment almost, to acclimate to the environment, and uh, you know to acclimate to individual circumstances, uh, tribal politics, to be able to you know turn on and turn off. Uh, different ways of being, to, to uh, pretend uh, to be an ally when you're an enemy. That kind of crap was probably very advantageous to our ancestors to just play along 
Um, and uh, so here we are stuck in a world where we're becoming more and more like <laughs> yeah, cats almost. Um, even though we have a, uh, a strong evolutionary bias towards family and tribe, we have, um, we have this other bias emerging uh, of our individuality. And uh, I guess to some extent cats have that too. Uh, so in some ways we parallel them. We do seem to have a limited network of associates. We can work together with a certain number of people and that's about it. Um, you know, in terms of affections, uh, they say we can only store in our brain, uh, you know, an, a name and identity for a hundred or so <laughs> friends and family, and then it gets kind of mushy after that. Uh, I don't know, I've never tested it. <laughs> I've never, I've never known a hundred interesting people at one time. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, it is a strange, strange circumstance to be stuck in that your own kind are alien. You know, that you're so different, so foreign in terms of how you simply interpret this shit. <laughs> you know, this, this shit that this is, the stuff it is. You interpret it so differently that, uh, yeah, you wouldn't uh, some, sometimes you just almost think, gee, it'd be nice to be able to you know, run across a field with a big giant hammer and smash that fucker in the head. Um, and yet it's an earthling. It's not an alien invader. It's not some tentacled monster. It's not, uh, it's not even a body snatcher. But somehow we've managed to find a way, uh, you know, to take what's here take the information, the shit, and somehow interpret it, understand it, dissect it, uh, perceive it, smell it, touch it, taste it, be it, all that crap, in entirely different ways. Uh, and I say certain words, people's perceptions will be entirely different. Uh, you know, we'll have common references like pretty common anyway. If I say, even if I say the word blue though, some people think of light blue, some people think of dark blue. You know, some people think of coral. <laughs> you know, it's just more like green. But anyway, um, you know, it's just so little consistency on those levels. And I guess the real irritation is, is that I think on the raw, scientific, methodical, um, you know, the real truth-seeking, uh, let's see, what's the words for this? <laughs> you know, non-wishful thinking, non-perverted, non-religious, non-distorted, uh, you know, a nice, clean, clinical, sterile view of this stuff. Uh, we should be able to reach some, you know, common statements about what the function is and how it's functioning and whether that function is something to applaud or to moan and be moan uh, rationally. I know it sounds stupid to bemoan rationally, <laughs> but I think it, there is a, a, a clear rational element to um, uh, the things, the correlates, the things that create our emotions. All emotions aren't irrational. And our emotions of empathy, I would argue, are probably the most rational of our emotions. Um, in the sense that we're basically just doing something as simple as imagining ourselves in a circumstance and doing the obvious logic of Ooh, I wouldn't like that, which doesn't take much effort at all. Uh, anyway, enough of an add-on, I believe. So, 
yeah, until the next video. So, you know, 25 minutes or so. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah.